Arabica by Wolf Hogan. Part 1. Fast Friends. Marcus Campbell could not help but feel nauseous while riding the city bus across town. The smell of stale urine and diesel exhaust combined made the contents of his stomach desire an escape. Public transportation was never his cup of tea, but he had no choice since his license was recently suspended for the fifth and possibly final time. The public transit system of Torrey, New York had not been updated since the summer of 1996. While other cities used magnetic key cards and laser-etched bus fare tokens, the industrial town of Torrey stuck to the age-old motto, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. A tiny slip of paper with your specific route X'd out with a golf pencil served as your proof of purchase. Once you have reached your destination, the bus driver punches a hole over the specific location of your departure and sends you on your way. You may be thinking to yourself, that doesn't sound so bad. But on a busy weekday, hole punching the tickets of a few dozen, often late commuters, adds about 15 to 20 minutes to everyone's estimated time of arrival. Luckily for Marcus, this day was not busy. It wasn't even a weekday. To us, it was an ordinary Saturday afternoon. But for Marcus, it was his last chance at bringing some dignity back into his life. The definition of alcoholism is a chronic disease characterized by uncontrolled drinking and preoccupation with alcohol. But when it came to Marcus and his quote-unquote hobby, preoccupation was somewhat of an understatement. Marcus inherited many traits from his father. Nearsightedness, high metabolism, a devilish smile, and a powerful thirst. Every night since his 21st birthday, Marcus has gone to bed in the warm embrace of spirits. Much like St. Eustace, he's seen the face of God, but not between the antlers of a stag, no. His vision appeared between prison bars. The second to last public intoxication arrest is what set this young man on the straight and narrow path to a new beginning. What started as a nightcap with friends unknowingly transitioned into a tipsy walkabout guided by the inner monologue of a lost soul searching for an identity. A customized rite of passage known only to the spirit within. An uncontrollable urge to move. A trek into the next stage of existence. The journey led Marcus to the inside of a steel cage. The ultraviolet lights were unbearable in his current state of intoxication. He saw nothing but darkness beyond the cold bars in front of him. The darkness slowly evaporated as blades of light appeared from the center of its cold embrace. With one eye closed, Marcus noticed the brilliant light forming between the cell bars. From where he was standing, it looked as if a glowing cross was being birthed from another dimension. He could feel an overwhelming heat and a sense of unconditional love. That was the moment Marcus decided to take control of his actions, purge the flesh, and seek help. Not before getting another DUI, of course. The rickety city bus stopped in front of an enormous brick building just as Marcus woke from a heroic daydream. He stood up to gather his belongings, a forest green backpack, a bottle of water, and a crinkled brown paper lunch bag containing two empty sandwich bags and a honey crisp apple. While making his way to the front of the bus, Marcus made eye contact and nodded to the other passengers. His salutations were met with blank stares, followed by averted eye contact. Thank you, he said to the bus driver, a heavy-set white gentleman with a cheap menthol cigarette hanging from the corner of his mouth. Indoor smoking of any kind hadn't been permitted in New York State since late 2003, but since the outdated smoke detectors had never been replaced, the driver as well as the passengers saw that as an opportunity to light up without fear of any real consequences. Thick black clouds of exhaust poured from the bus's muffler as it peeled away from Marcus, who was standing two feet from the large sign that read, Tory Family Community Center. Marcus gingerly reached into his pocket and pulled out a ripped piece of paper. He compared the writing on the paper to the address written on the building's sign. Nice, he uttered to himself as he began walking toward the brick bastille. Stepping over the threshold of the front door, Marcus was met with the fragrance of old textbooks and fresh varnish. 212, 212, 210, 211. Ah, here it is, 212. Marcus negotiated with himself while searching for the correct room. Right below the room number 212 
was a handwritten sign taped to the yellowish tile wall that said, Alcoholic Support Group, written in faded, dying black permanent marker. Marcus took one last deep breath before entering the echoey room. In the far left corner was a large group of people sitting in a giant oval. People of all shapes, sizes, and colors, many of whom looked as though they didn't belong in such a place. Soccer moms, businessmen, troubled teens, and the occasional criminal, all of them brought together by the love of spirits, much like a church's congregation. In the center of the circle stood an older gentleman. He appeared to be an intellectual of some kind, thick-rimmed glasses, wrinkled brown blazer with suede elbow patches, slim-fitting khakis, plaid button-up shirt neatly tucked in, and penny loafers that were worn down almost to the sole. Marcus couldn't help but notice that the man heavily resembled the gentleman on the Uncle Ben's logo, minus the warm smile and kind, tired eyes. The man acknowledged Marcus as he approached the group. Hello there, welcome. Your name is? He projected over the bustling of cheaply made industrial chairs on the coral tile floor. Marcus. Campbell. Sorry I'm late. The man quickly examined a piece of paper attached to a clipboard and responded almost immediately. Ah, yes. Here you are, Marcus. Please have a seat. Also, don't apologize. It does nothing to change the situation. The damage is already done. Marcus followed the circle of people with his eyes until he found the first empty seat available. He quickly placed his items behind his chair and sat quietly. To his left was a young man in a coffee shop uniform. To his right was an attractive young woman who appeared to be close in age to Marcus. Hey, I'm Marcus, said Marcus to each of the group members on either side of him. They gave him a quick silent smile and nod but averted their attention back to the group leader. Now that you all are finally here, we can continue, said the group leader as he glared angrily at a dumbfounded Marcus. Would you two please inform Mr. Campbell of the plan of action we discussed earlier, said the group leader in a thick New England accent. With a raised right hand, he gestured in the direction of Marcus and the two members on either side of him. The young man in the coffee shop uniform nodded his head in agreement and slowly turned to face Marcus. Hi, I'm Eric, he said with a smile. There was something about his artificial service industry cheery demeanor that was oddly comforting to Marcus in that moment. Eric looked slightly past Marcus to the young lady seated next to him. And this is Abigail? Angela, the young woman corrected. Oh, my bad, stuttered Eric. It's okay, said Angela in an understanding tone. Angela didn't seem like the type of person to be spending her Saturday among addicts, repenting for their sins. She was the type of woman you would expect to spend the weekend transporting her purebred Cocker Spaniel to an expensive 4-H dog show in Manhattan. The kind of woman who wasn't married but newly engaged to a tall, handsome businessman with a 401k and an appreciation for everything artistic. She looked at Marcus and smiled. The delighted look on her face, along with the sweet smell of her perfume, placed Marcus in a trance. With each inhale of her scent came a new vision of their possible life together. The lucid daydream was cut short by Eric's deep and raspy voice. Marcus, you good? Oh, yeah, sorry, just thinking, said Marcus, swimming in a river of embarrassment. Angela, it's nice to meet you. Marcus extended his hand for her to shake. Her hand was cold and clammy, but as soft as topsoil after a spring rain. It's nice to meet you too, said Angela as she quickly retracted her hand. What brought you guys here, if you don't mind me asking? Asked Marcus in a curious tone. I'm in a messy custody battle with my baby moms. In order to have visitation back, I have to complete this course, said Eric. Marcus could tell that Eric was the type of person that didn't mind sharing personal information, even if it meant being judged by others. Let's just say my drinking has interfered with my professional life, said Angela, as she slowly lowered her head with the shame that comes along with letting her addictions negatively impact her existence. Well, our misfortune has brought us all together for one reason or another, so we probably should look on the bright side. 
To new beginnings? Proposed Marcus as he stuck out his right hand, palm face down. What are we supposed to do? Yell, let's go team on three? Put your hand down. This ain't remember the Titans, Mocky Mock, said Eric sarcastically. Eric and Angela shared a laugh at Marcus's expense. I'm kidding. Hands in, said Eric as he held out his right hand in front of the three of them. Marcus and Angela followed suit. Go team on three? One, two, three. Go team! The three of them belted out with glee. Excuse me, please keep the banter to a minimum, said the group leader angrily. Marcus, Eric, and Angela snickered to themselves as they slightly slumped down in their chairs as to not draw any more attention to themselves. At the end of the support group meeting, the group leader gave the members the opportunity to mingle with one another. The goal for the meeting was to assign everyone an accountability partner, someone to hold them accountable for their actions on their way to sobriety. In a serendipitous turn of events, Marcus and Angela were assigned to be each other's accountability partners. They exchanged numbers and had a small discussion on their ultimate goals in completing the program. Marcus found great pride in knowing that a fellow black person was taking initiative and freeing themselves from the loving embrace of addiction, even if that initiative was court-ordered. Soon after parting ways with Angela, Marcus walked over to the refreshment area on the far side of the room. Since the moment he'd walked into the building, he had been bombarded with the smell of freshly roasted coffee. Marcus had never been much of a coffee drinker, outside of the occasional carafe of stale, ice-cold black coffee in between busing tables back when he was a banquet waiter up in Saratoga Springs. He wasn't sure why the smell was so alluring to him at that moment. He thought that maybe given the circumstances, he found comfort in the familiar smell. A smell that reminded him of Saturday morning breakfast from when he was a kid, before his parents divorced. Or maybe it was because he hadn't had anything to eat that day, and the smell of hot coffee usually means it's breakfast time. Whatever the reason was, wasn't important, because before he could even realize what was happening, Marcus poured himself a cup and gently lifted it to his nose for a long, slow inhale. The blood of 110 Arabica beans danced carelessly on his taste buds as he took the first small sip. Images flooded his mind with each gulp, the Ethiopian sun beating down on the backs of farmers, tirelessly harvesting the ripe, plump berries. Merchants loading hundreds of shipping containers headed to the States to supply the high demand for that particular species of bean. Next, he felt the rush that comes with the consumption of caffeine, that feeling that's comparable to leaning back a little too far in your chair without actually falling. He felt a wave of self-confidence rush over him, like a stampede of endorphins. For the first time in decades, that persistent thirst, that longing to get drunk, was gone. All that was left was that scared little boy Marcus had buried in an ocean of alcohol once the pain of living became unbearable. While making a half-assed attempt to mingle, Eric circled the room sheepishly. He chuckled to himself when he noticed Marcus basically making out with his cup of coffee in the corner. Never met somebody with a coffee kink before, said Eric as he swiftly walked over to Marcus. I didn't know I had one until now, <laughs> laughed Marcus. Damn, this coffee is amazing, said Marcus in disbelief. I know, right? Got it for my job. They don't coffee to support groups in the area, replied Eric. What flavor is this? said Marcus. Mountain blueberry with vanilla bean and mint extract, said Eric as he cleaned his glasses with the corner of his forest green apron. Unbelievable, said Marcus as he furled his brow. It fascinated Marcus that he had never thought of that flavor combination before. It made so much sense. You really like our coffee, huh? You know, we're looking for another part-time employee. If you want to email my manager your resume, I'll put in a good word for you, said Eric with a half smile. The way Eric was raised spoke volumes about his character. From an early age, he'd had the desire to lend a helping hand to any fellow person of color, just because. It was a key component to the meaning of life according to his philosophy. I don't know, said Marcus in a skeptical tone. I was looking for something a little more stable. Eric paused for a moment before replying. Did I mention you get all the free coffee you can drink? Marcus's eyes widened. A smile crept over his lips as he began to speak. When can I start? Part 2. Cold Shoulders Three months had passed. It was now winter, and Marcus was well on his way to becoming an assistant manager at Black Magic Coffee Company. Sobriety suited Marcus well. He finally felt that his life had meaning. Between working 40 hours a week and keeping in close contact with Angela, 
He found a healthy balance between his work and professional life. His relationship with Angela was teetering on the edge of accountability partner and potential love interest, seeing how they gave each other their first non-intoxicated sexual encounter. Sobriety was no longer a daunting task, but a golden ticket to prosperity which Angela, Marcus, and Eric had front row seats. Monday afternoon was usually when Angela came into the coffee shop for their weekly goal discussion. They would make a list of every goal they wanted to reach for that week. They would then spitball ideas of how to help each other reach said goals. The alcoholic support group long since ended, but their diligence persisted. Both Marcus and Angela had made a pact. Since day one, they dedicated their lives to clean living, which is why it was rather strange that Angela hadn't shown up for their meeting that day. In fact, she hadn't so much as sent an explanatory text message. Minutes turned into hours and hours into days without a single word. Situations like these caused Marcus to always assume the worst. He would have assumed Angela was the victim of some freak accident if she wasn't so active on social media. It appeared that some of Angela's family members had come into town to celebrate the birth of her sister's baby. The whole family was staying at grandma's for a few weeks. This giant ancient house on the south end of town near the factory district, Angela seemed proud to be an aunt. At least that's what her status expressed. Marcus felt guilty for growing angry with Angela. He understood that in order to maintain a healthy friendship, he would have to respect her boundaries. Another day had gone by, and besides a little lower back pain, Marcus woke up feeling satisfactory. His freshly dry cleaned work uniform hung eagerly in the closet above his all black slip proof server shoes. The outfit resembled a superhero's costume under the dimly lit closet light bulb. His apartment was a toasty 75 degrees, keeping him unmoved by the fresh powder that blanketed the northeastern city. Little droplets of piping hot water splashed on the drawstring of his bathrobe as he filled the sink preparing to shave. Thick layers of shaving cream melted away with every stroke of his five-blade name-brand razor. Marcus began to daydream. He found it curious that he was never taught to shave. He remembered watching his father shave every morning for years. So when it came time for him to start shaving, he just mimicked whatever his father was doing. Maybe it was the same with his addiction to alcohol, he thought. Marcus heard the sound of three faint beeps coming from the kitchen as he finished getting dressed. It was the coffee maker vying for attention. The smell of tanzany and peaberry with burdock and ginger root filled the kitchen. It became Marcus's favorite coffee blend ever since the Northeastern New York Coffee Expo, a year and a half after he accepted the job at Black Magic, Marcus always made sure he had at least 45 minutes to enjoy a nice hot breakfast. On this day, he had his usual breakfast of old-fashioned oatmeal with brown sugar and sliced strawberries and a cinnamon raisin bagel on the side smothered in butter and fig jam. Marcus ate slowly, enjoying each morsel of food that was washed down with his expensive coffee. He remembers back during his hellish days of addiction. He would scarf so fast he didn't even have time to taste what he was eating. Not that what he was eating was even worth tasting in the first place. The Bluetooth speaker on the fridge played soft jazz music that accented the moment perfectly. All of the shades were drawn, but the apartment was lit by a few small lamps spread evenly throughout the place. Marcus had achieved peace in his new life, something that didn't come easy. In his mind, the only thing left to obtain was the love of a good woman, or at least for the time being, a second helping of oatmeal. The coffee shop parking lot was partially plowed, making it difficult for Marcus to park in his usual parking spot. He thought nothing of it since he was just grateful to even have a car, let alone a valid driver's license. Marcus kept his head down as he trekked through the dirty sleet that covered the parking lot. By the time he reached the front door, his shoes looked like they were covered in Coca-Cola flavored slushy. With his head still facing the floor, Marcus kicked the frozen debris from his shoes and raised his head to find Eric standing at the door to greet him. Eric had a big grin on his face. The only other time Marcus had seen Eric smile that big was when corporate announced that all employee lunches would be extended by 15 minutes. What? said Marcus with a confused look on his face. Let me guess, lunch has been extended to an hour, said Marcus sarcastically. Nope, barked Eric. He then pulled out a small rectangular box he had been holding behind his back. Here, said Eric in a pushy tone. Open it, he nudged. All in one motion, with a blank expression on his face, Marcus opened the box, half expecting a cheaply made ballpoint pen with the company logo printed on the side. There was no pen or any other cheaply made pacifier, but a bronze name tag that read Marcus, Assistant Manager, in bold letters. Marcus smiled from ear to ear. 
He almost couldn't believe it, although he had been working toward the promotion since the beginning of his employment with the company. His hard work and perseverance led him to the land of milk and honey, or coffee and sweet cream, if you want to get technical about it. Part 3. Hourglass Everything that came with being an assistant manager was pretty cut and dry. Increased pay, longer lunch, more authority, opening and closing capabilities, and the power to hire or fire any employee with the approval of the general manager. Not that Marcus would ever willingly fire someone, but it was nice to know that he could if he had to. The promotion also came with a $100 gift card to Apple Tree Steakhouse, which Marcus planned on using that very night. He decided to break the good news to his parents over a meal on him, which he knew they wouldn't be able to accept as reality given his habit of mismanaging money. The invitation text to both of his parents read, Meet me at Apple Trees at 7.10 p.m. tonight. I have some good news to tell you. P.S. Don't worry, dinner's on me. Knowing what his parents thought about him, he figured they were expecting him to come out of the closet in public to avoid an outrage from his father. Thinking of that made Marcus chuckle to himself. The time was 7.23 p.m. and his parents still hadn't arrived. They also hadn't responded to any of Marcus's where are you text messages. His female server approached his table for the fifth time since he arrived. She noticed Marcus was the only person at the table still. Can I get you anything else, sweetie? Or are we still waiting for mom and dad? You can tell she felt bad by the way her voice deepened after each question. Yep. Still waiting. I'll have another Diet Cola, though, if you don't mind, said Marcus, who also felt bad, but for a different reason. Of course, I'll be right back. The server turned to leave, but stopped once Marcus asked another question. Where's your restroom? The server pointed to the far back left corner of the restaurant. On his way to the bathroom, Marcus looked around at all of the different groups of people enjoying each other's company. Older people with their grandchildren, couples on a first date, college students celebrating good grades, and kids crying from the embarrassment of clapping waitstaff, all singing the happy birthday song in unison. Marcus thought about how many people were in attendance, and how many of them will have passed away by morning for whatever reason. A feeling of comfort rushed over him when out of the corner of his eye, he noticed an older woman holding a baby. As one life comes to an end, one is just beginning. Before reaching the bathroom door, Marcus did a double take when he noticed a familiar face sitting near the old woman. It was Angela, laughing with who appeared to be family members. Her eyes were fixed on the baby as she wiggled her finger in front of her, making bubble-popping noises. Marcus's heart sank when he thought about walking over to say hi. He thought of how long it had been since they spoke, and how weird it would be for him to show up out of nowhere. The last thing he wanted is to be painted a stalker. Marcus slowly turned away from the large table and started toward the bathroom. Marcus? said a friendly voice. Marcus turned to see Angela looking at him from her seat. Marcus walked over to the table. Angela? Hey, funny seeing you here. Angela looked slightly nervous as she continued to smile. Marcus couldn't help but notice the plethora of alcoholic beverages on the table. We're just celebrating the birth of my niece, that's all, said Angela as she broke out into a cold sweat. Of course, replied Marcus as he looked at the empty shot glasses directly in front of Angela. We were just cheersing to new life, you know? Angela pleaded quietly. That's wonderful. Congratulations to you and your family, said Marcus, successfully holding back tears. At that moment, Marcus didn't feel the slightest bit of anger. He felt immense disappointment, as if he were the one drinking. So does this mean... Before Marcus could finish his question, he felt a warm hand on his shoulder. Marky, said his father. Ah, sorry we're late, son. You know how your mother be. Always taking nine years for her to get ready. I don't know how her new husband deals with it. Anyway... Who's your friend here? He said while gesturing to Angela. Marcus thought for a moment as he looked at his parents and then back at Angela. Just an old friend, he said in a defeated tone before disappearing into the restroom. The weather was now warm. A new alcoholic support group had opened up at the community center and Marcus had been assistant manager for over a year. Black Magic Coffee was doing better than ever. There was even talks of opening a fifth location near the Catskills, but nothing was set in stone just yet. Eric moved on to bigger and better things. By the grace of God, he was awarded visitation by the court, which meant he could take his son on a road trip to make up for lost time. Nowhere far 
maybe the overlooked mountain in Woodstock to let the kid feel like he's on top of the world for a few moments. Just like any other morning, Marcus opened the shop exactly at 8 a.m. One of his employees arrived at 9 once Marcus's opening duties were just about done. This morning was unusually slow for a Wednesday, although the amount of traffic and pedestrians were still about the same. Mr. Campbell, can I go on break now? asked Marcus's employee Malik. Yes, absolutely. Enjoy, said Marcus with a smile. Marcus decided to clean the cracks in between the steel panels of the cash register. He figured that mindless task could kill at least a half an hour. Marcus crouched in front of the register to retrieve the industrial cleaning spray and a makeshift wash rag. While popping his head back up to the surface, he noticed a young woman standing in front of the cash register looking at the menu behind the counter. Surprised and a little startled, he quickly put the cleaner and rag back under the register, then regained his balance to take the young woman's order. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you come in, said Marcus with a smile. It's all right, I haven't been here long, said the young woman, still focused on the menu. Let me get a tall caramel macchiato, said the young woman. Fantastic. Will that be all? asked Marcus. Um, yep, thank you, chirped the young woman. Okay, your total is going to be $6.18. Would you like me to sign you up for our rewards program? Buy four items and get the fifth one free, said Marcus for the 60th time that day. Sure. Is it free? Asked the young woman in a concerned tone. Yep. All I need is your first name, last name, and email address. And phone number, said Marcus proudly. Okay. Phone number is 518-555-4326. Email is a lee at gmail.com. And my name is Arabica Lee, said the young woman, who was now slightly embarrassed. Marcus quickly asked, wait. So your parents named you... Yep, after coffee. They thought it sounded nice, replied Arabica. I'm just glad inner city school children didn't know the origin of their parents' favorite coffee. She said, chuckling a bit. It's a really beautiful name. Really? I'm not just saying that because I work at a coffee shop, said Marcus, holding back a smile. Well, thank you, said Arabica as she began rummaging through her purse. She quickly handed Marcus six single dollar bills, then went back to rummage for the exact change. Here we go said Arabica as she handed Marcus a handful of coins. Before Marcus could count the change, he noticed that one of the coins was significantly larger than the others. Upon looking at it, he noticed it was a sobriety coin with a large one year engraved in the center. Marcus gently placed the coin in front of Arabica. Don't want to lose that, he said softly with a smile. Ah, shit. I'm sorry. <laughs> this type of coin won't get me much in a place like this, huh? <laughs> Laughed Arabica. Marcus reached into his pocket to retrieve his own sobriety coin. He placed it on the counter next to her, and in a confident tone, he said, You'd be surprised. The End